The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world, we appreciate each and every one. Tonight we got a great show lined up. Um, unfortunately, uh, Barbara is not able to be in the, in the chat tonight. Uh, somebody's throwing a wild party there at her place and noise is too loud. And uh, Jeff, I have not seen him yet come in uh, to on on to uh, uh, on, on the Skype for me for uh, to get him. So with that though, uh, last week we did have a problem that I couldn't even get on uh, because Skype totally went bonkers on me. It wouldn't even recognize me. I couldn't use it. It took me four days before I could get Skype back. So. Once I did, I'm here again now, ready to go this week, and hope everybody is doing good. Uh, Tonight, we do have with us, though, Tabby Cat Gash. Hi, everybody. And we do have a great guest lined up for tonight. And I guess, um, how is things going over there, Tabby? Uh, You mean over in Maryland? Uh, We just recently... We just recently came out of a uh, very uh, nasty heat spell where we were well over 90-some degrees for like uh, almost five days straight. And we had some really severe thunderstorms uh, just about every afternoon for a couple of days because of it. And finally, today, we've got a break. It's well, actually below 90. Well, that's so good. It, it feels uh, kind of cool outside for a change. I know I know. last week I got a, a message from Craig, and he said that there had been a huge uptick in COVID cases uh, in the area there. So we're monitoring it, and we're going to see what it's like in September uh, before we make a decision if we're going to be able to do our thing in October. Yeah, I'm hoping that uh, it works out because I tell you, you know, COVID has really put a kibosh on an awful lot of activities, you know, between just visiting friends and relatives to, you know, some of the things that everybody enjoys, including all of the get togethers that we've had over the years with the paranormal view. And I'll tell you, we've missed it. Every darn one of us have missed getting together and enjoying the fun and the laughter and the investigations and just the general overall camaraderie. I know. And I know. so I'm hoping that it works out. And and I have too. Um, so why don't you uh, first um, introduce our guest and we'll bring them in. Okay. Well, tonight's very special guest is Sharon Galloway. And Sharon is a native to my state of Maryland. She is a very gifted psychic medium. She is also a trans medium, uh, gifted in trans mediumship, is certified in past life hypnosis. She is a holistic pain specialist and extremely gifted in the art of thoughtography, which we will get into. So, welcome to the show, Sharon. Hello, all. How are you doing? Now, are, are you living in the Gettysburg area now? No, I'm just frequently there. It's not that far away from me. Okay, good. Because that's where we usually meet up uh, every year, and, and we usually have a big following that comes and uh, just goes out with us wherever we got a place that's picked out, and uh, we investigate and just have a good time. Um, just a little bit. Uh, about me, I, I do investigations, but uh, I am not a psychic or a medium. I only 
uh, use my recorder. And uh, although I do, uh, I do it, it, it works uh, uh, great. Um, and I work with mediums who will be able to tell me things about the location that we're doing. But I only get stuff uh, on the recorder. I don't, uh, very seldom have I ever been able to say, oh, I seen something or I felt something. Very, very seldom uh, does that happen. Uh, once was at Gettysburg where I did see things, but that's, that's later. Uh, anyway, um, one of the questions that, that I really uh, would like to know is uh, what is thoughtography? Well, I call it thoughtography, but it's also called projected thermography or psychic photography or in Japanese, nensha. And the reason that I bring up the Japanese is because the term photography was first introduced by Tomokichi Fukarai. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not, my Japanese is not too good. <laughs> but he was one of the first ones working with plate glass cameras who noticed this. And photography is the ability to produce images from one's own mind onto such surfaces as photographic film by spiritual or supernatural means. And um, actually, it's been known in America or in this part of the world, not Japan, since 1913. But the problem is when you talk about projected thermography, a lot of people associate that with an action originated from uh, the U.S. remake of the media movie The Ring. And this, has, this really has nothing to do with the movie The Ring. That's a whole different thing. Okay. But... Um, one of the first uh, books to mention psychic photography was the book The New Photography that was written in 1896. And the author's name was Chatwood. And I think it's Arthur, Arthur Chatwood. Arthur and he, Chatwood describes in, he describes in that book experiments where the images of objects on the retina of the human eye might so affect a photograph that it could be produced by looking at a sensitive plate. Now, further on in our discussion, I will get into that because I get into the chemistry. But basically, this is what photography is. It's, it's, it's a, I've been using Polaroids, digital, and uh, regular analog cameras for this experiment. I have quite a collection of antique Polaroids, by the way, which is very hard to find film for. But um, it, the idea is to be able to project your image that you have in your brain onto the film. So far on digital, it's a total blank. I've been able to do very limited, um, but I haven't really concentrated that much on it recently because COVID has kind of shut me down. Yeah. And you, you have to do these things in person. You cannot do them over the Internet. But one of the reasons that I even got into hypnosis is because the man who is most well-known for his uh, photography, his name is Ted Sirios, okay. he was hypnotized. And actually, he wasn't hypnotized to do photography. He was hypnotized because a friend of his had decided that they were going to look for buried treasure. So, <laughs> so they hypnotized uh, Ted. And um, they never found the treasure, but Ted all of a sudden became aware that he was able to project his thoughts onto, first it was a, a brownie box camera, but then later he started using Polaroids. Yeah. Isn't he the one so, that I we used to see on a lot of those shows where no. um, he actually looked like he was hurting or something he would put his head up against the camera and he would look like he oh, was yeah. just in so much pain because he was projecting these thoughts is that the same one well it could be ted wasn't as well known as yuri geller he was very popular at the same time remember the guy that bent spoons right okay um the thing about ted 
was that most people didn't want to work with him because he was not dapper and urbane as Geller was um, assumed to be. I don't really know that much about Yuri Geller's personal life because I haven't investigated him. But Ted, um, he kind of preferred the Polaroid camera, but he could also work with film convention or conventional film cameras. But he would ordinarily sit. Now, I've tried this myself. He would ordinarily sit with a bright light source shining from behind him over one shoulder, and he held the camera on his knees or his lap. But he would set the focus lever, uh, and he would tape it at infinity. And he would have the lens pointing towards his face. And this is how he managed images from both kinds of cameras. Sometimes he did it when the lens had been entirely removed. So I think that's kind of amazing myself. Um, But most of the time he held something that he called a gizmo. And uh, typically this was a rolled up piece of the black Polaroid paper that is the cover for the film coming out. I don't know if you remember this, how long it's been since you've worked with a Polaroid. But these are the old style Polaroids where you actually had to peel off you know, the the cover the, of right. the film. Yeah. And I also know that uh, Sirius preferred to work with a wink light to a flash, but he actually preferred the absence of any camera light attachment. I've tried it with both. Um, and this would be uh, something that, you know, along with his, what he called the gizmo, this is something that, you know that he relied upon. So we, I do know that Sirius has produced images from the camera held at a distance from him, separated from him by I think it was a lead glass screen, pointed away from him at a blank wall, and triggered by other participants who were in a session that involved him demonstrating his abilities. And he also uh, succeeded when the gizmo was held in position by uh, invited observers. There, there was a lot of uh, interest in Ted when he was, you know, really good at this. Eventually, after I think it was about three years, he actually produced an image of curtains, which Jewel Eisenbud, which is one of his main uh, backers, uh, knew to be that was the end. And it pretty much was. Huh. But one of the interesting things I found out about Ted, and I have found this to be true with a lot of psychics, mediums, people who work in the paranormal field, is that he was severely disabled in the Vietnam War. He had TB. He had a lot of health issues. And I thought, I, this, is, this is another project that I might launch into some other time, examining why so many people with psychic abilities suffer from health issues. So I kind of wondered if that aided him. But the problem was I have not been able to find any information uh, regarding if Ted had an autopsy. I don't think one was done. Okay. Because his brain would have been interesting. Oh, yeah. Now, Sharon, when you do your projections onto uh, Polaroid, have you looked into any possibility that the reason that that seems to work so well are maybe the the combination of chemicals that are on the paper that it well, might be interacting of, with the thought process? Well, it's one of the things that I thought of immediately because there had been uh, – someone described uh, Ted's working uh, the way he, that he works. As, you know, like he would strain, the veins would pop out, and his face would get red. And someone described that as almost being like a histamine effect. And we all know, we're all familiar with Benadryl. That's an antihistamine. Right. So if he was somehow able to produce histamine, then um, it would certainly change the pH of his body which is also one of the things that I've looked into extensively regarding mediums and their ability, not only their brains, but, you know, the effect of the histamine. But with someone like Ted, um, 
when when he was about to shoot or about to do a session, he seemed to rapidly go into a state of intense concentration, but his eyes were open, his lips compressed, and there was a lot of tension in his whole body, and his limbs would tend to shake somewhat, like his the foot of his he would sit with his cross legs and his uh, leg that went over the other one would shake up and down compulsively or convulsively. And um, his face would become blotchy. And any physiologist might assume that a heightened venous pressure was being produced by the histamine effect. And that's something that occur- occurs, uh, like with bee stings or allergic rashes, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Ted also considered a racing heart a good sign, and actually, I know this to be true myself. Once your heart starts to race, then you know you're in. Huh. And that's, yeah, that's that's with me. I don't know how, I, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're just doing a reading, no, you know, I don't think so. But if you're really concentrating on trying to find, you know, like what is in the area and you're trying to read the area, uh, that's, it can happen. Yeah. Well, that, that might be because of the emotions that you're going through, because um, I know that sometimes if I'm trying to read an area or a person or be in tuned to a particular spirit, if I'm feeling some type of emotion going on, either from the surroundings or from the person or whatever, I can feel my heart beginning to to pick up a beat because right. of that emotion, that adrenaline and everything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it makes sense. Well, um, you wanted to know about the silver mm-hmm. on the film? Yeah. Okay. It actually is the base in various forms for all photographic cellulose or plastic film. And it was used in plate glass and Polaroids. And um, the silver is an outermost electron of, a, of an atom uh, that determines the physical properties of the matter. And you can take away one electron from a silver atom, you get a silver ion, which is water-soluble, or a halide, which is a silver salt. So in its ionic form, that's the water, silver is highly reactive with other elements, which means it would really, readily combine to form compounds. So if you take into effect everything that's going on in that room around Ted, that a person's pH, the sweat, the ambient temperature, and other conditions could affect the photography photos because if you can smell the sweat, it's there in the air. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorry, that's kind of rude, but that's what it is. No, no, no. And I'm also thinking because he was a habitual drunk that his P, his body pH would be different than somebody who is not. And um, the pH uh, describes the relative acid content of the human blood, um, and it's determined by the presence of a substance called phosphate. And when you drink alcohol as much as Ted drank, it, tr- it, it triggers changes in your phosphate levels that can lead to an increase in your blood pH. So, and everybody sweats, so you can assume that all this is coming out in his sweat. So there's also, you know, like I have in my, in my reports and things that I've done on this before I get into the sweat glands, I'm not sure you want to hear about that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, these are the things that I think, you know, can, uh, would have helped Ted since he is the most acclaimed photographer ever. And you have to take into consideration that the forehead and palms of Ted Sirius would have come into contact with or had been in close proximity to his gizmo and the camera. Yeah. And unexposed film upon which the reactive silver halides reside. I mean, they're in the camera, but still we're talking about air. And perhaps... Uh, the true PSI was Ted Sirius' Ted Sirius's ability to manipulate the silver on the Polaroids and other films 
through his own chemical or metabolic sweat, along with the particular psychokinesis he has demonstrated with his photography. Yeah. So, well, you got to figure that uh, that anything that we do, um, <coughs> excuse me, hairball, uh, physiologically, <laughs> you know, because uh, when we give off, as as you said, you know, sweat or any kind of uh, glandular thing, whether it's you know flatulation yeah. or uh, pheromone, hormone, whatever, um, our environment is going to react to that. And if you are around, say, chemicals or liquids or something that can interact with it, that does make sense. And if he's a, if he was able, or anyone, including yourself, <coughs> excuse me again, are able to use your ability to, you know, uh, either produce or control, you know, these uh, conditions, then, yeah, uh, it, well, ten, I think just has. about anybody would be able to do it if they were to have the right conditions. Right. Well, somebody would have to get, like, real drunk first. <laughs> 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 I actually considered asking someone to do that for me, but... Also, you know, in the sweat is a whole lot of other substances. There's like ammonia, protein, sugar, potassium, bicarbonate. Uh, there could be uh, copper, iron, cadmium, and I maybe a little manganese. But there's a lot of stuff in there that could affect, excuse me, the cellulose on the film and the silver halides. So, you know, this is all, of course in the air, suspended in the air. And what I said was true. If you can smell the sweat, it's in the air. Yeah. So, so is all this other stuff. But going back to considering asking somebody to get really, really drunk, <laughs> I'm, I'm not real sure I want to do that. But if somebody's willing, <laughs> I'm there with all my cameras. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do it under experimental conditions and go from there. Why not? Yep. But I, I do feel that his alcohol induced his metabolic changes and possibly enhanced his abilities, uh, you know, to do the photography. I, you know, I can't think of any other reason why only this man, you know, has been so successful. Yeah. So, and at any rate, so he was hypnotized. And he was a habitual drunk. He was also really belligerent and nasty and apparently was a womanizer. So I didn't delve into that. But because, um, <laughs> I mean, you've seen pictures of him. You'd be like, mm, yeah, no, I don't think so. But at any rate, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, meow, meow. But <laughs> so how but did you wonder... get involved in, in, in what you do this? I mean, it, it sounds like an extreme process it sounds you need to, to do a great deal of well, concentration you need to have the right set of circumstances uh, it sounds like for me oh my goodness it, that would take my brain exploding in order to do it so how did you get involved in no, it no no i ran occupy the law um i've studied law i've written many many legal briefs i know how to you know like take all the notes put them in order put them in the chronological order so there's a sequence that eventually makes sense. So this really wasn't too tough for me. Now, finding the information I need made it a little tough. Um, there is a huge exhibit at UMBC down off Wilkins Avenue. I, I'm not sure if that's in the actual city or not. It's either in the border of the city or right outside the city. But there is all of Ted's uh, Polaroids are down there. Hmm. And I went, down, I went down there and viewed them and tried to read them. I got absolutely nothing because there was too many people in the library. <clears throat> but um, it's very interesting that you were able to go down there and actually view, you know, the real, not a copy, but the real Polaroids that Ted did. Yeah. And, cause, you know, well, a lot of times when people put stuff on the web, they add contrast or whatever. But, it's, you know, it's not original. 
But um, I stumbled across that because of all of my um, experiences with art and photography and um, weird experiences, you know, that I've been having pretty much all my life with that. Because I have another project called Haunted Artists, and it's about the intrinsic and extrinsic forces that affect creative people. So one thing kind of bled into the other. And um, I wondered, you know, like my own paintings and wood burnings and carvings and things that I do, I wondered, uh, was this an outside or extrinsic force, or did I subconsciously, in the middle of one painting, just throw it to the side and start another, do this because deep down I wasn't satisfied with the results, or was I being challenged by an unknown entity that resided within or around me? And the thing is, I with when I did that, I was transferring my thoughts to the canvas. And sometimes that just inexplicably changed. So I consider that a psychic event. And I've done enough movies of me painting to see what's around me and hear the even pity. So... Anyway, I'm of, the abil- I'm of the opinion that the ability to transmit an image to film is psychokinetic, also known as PK, or the older term, telekinesis. And psychokinesis is the influence of mind on matter. Um, and I'm thinking that Yuri Geller was able to bend spoons, but I know other people that can bend spoons. You and I could probably do it. But he was never yeah. able to do it like in a laboratory situation. He was only able to do it when he was on stage. Ted, on the other hand, could do it whenever you wanted him to do it. Okay. <laughs> of course, he was probably drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it comes but, down to the difference between what uh, Ted Sirius uh, was able to do, uh, do you believe that Pretty much anybody, as long as they're able to concentrate on it and they believe that they can do it, do you think that anyone can actually be able to do this? Uh, Like I said, I'm not sure that I would be able to do it. I'm not sure I'd be able to concentrate that much. But do you think that anyone could actually train themselves to be able to project such as this? Anybody can train that. Anybody that can train themselves to meditate and um, go into uh, a deep meditation, which in itself is sort of a trance, should be able to. But one of my challenges that I'm going to throw at you right now is I'll hypnotize you and see if you can do it. Okay. Yeah. Ted Ted Serios was hypnotized, but he wasn't hypnotized to transmit the images. I'm not 100% sure what they were going to do, finding buried treasure, uh, because that's never been um, expanded upon. It's just been mentioned. But I was thinking, you know, like I've already hypnotized you. I'll hypnotize you again, and we'll work it out, and we'll see if you're able to do it. All right. Sounds Um, like a plan. All right. Yeah, because I wanted to meet you up at Antietam anyway, because I've been hearing stories about Antietam, so I want to go up there with my boatload of cameras. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll be more than happy to hold on to one of them. I mean, that one that you handed me that last time, that had a huge lens on it. But yeah, I'm willing to <laughs> put a couple oh, of uh, things around my neck and <laughs> walk around the battlefield that's, with you. <laughs> that's actually, that's a standard lens. Um, that, uh, that was a Z6, a Nikon Z6. Uh, that's a standard lens. I have a lens that weighs four pounds. Oh, um, and I have another little lens. My 50-millimeter lens is my favorite one to take out because, night, you know, night shot is very handy. But the problem is I don't always trust the result because you can be looking at a full apparition, but the night shot will show an orb. Huh. Oh. That's annoying. Yeah. So yeah. what I did was I got a 50-millimeter for my Nikon. And... um with the 50 millimeter, you can go down to F1. That just lets in all the ambient light in the world. You don't need night shot. It looks uh-huh. like daylight. And what you see then, I mean, okay, it's digital, but whatever. Um, 
I don't especially trust all digital cameras because you can really fiddle around with those settings too. Yeah. And with the polar with the Polaroid, by the way, you can. You know, I mean, unless you go to great lengths. Yeah. But um, that's why I always have a Polaroid with me because it is what it is. Yeah, you, so that, that doesn't years. lie. <laughs> that does not lie. Yeah. Now, you know, you might have a dirty roller, but you can see that it'll show up as a streak. Yeah, you know, and it'll show and up on every single one. That's right. So then you know, okay, this is a dirty roller. But I've caught more with Polaroids and my 50 millimeter than anything else. Yeah. But um, I was also going to mention, you know, like um, people who say that they don't hear or see anything. I can hypnotize them to be sensitive. Oh, Henry. But yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm Henry. not real sure they yeah, want that, right. though. <laughs> no? Jeff, you uh, back. I'm not, I, I'm not real sure because, as you know and I know, when you can hear, see, smell, and feel these things 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it can be a bit tiresome. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. At least once or twice a day, I'm like, get out. <laughs> so, Jeff, you on? <laughs> yes, I've, I've been on for quite a listening and impressed. Ah. Sorry for the delay, and of course Skype was. <laughs> All right, How you doing, Jeff? A minute I got on. Hello, Tab. All right. Uh, hello, Sharon. <laughs> hello. All right, hello. I got um, I got a another quick question. Well, I don't guess it's quick, but I keep hearing. Uh, I guess I've been into this since uh, November of 2008 doing the show. And I've heard this before and many times. I still don't know what it is and don't understand it. But what is the Akashic Records? Oh, well, that is part of the past life hypnosis. You can also do it yourself in trance. It's actually better the first couple of times to be guided, either in a guided meditative state or in hypnosis. Hypnosis is always better because it takes you deeper. But the Akashic Records is everything about you from the beginning of time till the end of time. I don't, you know, like everything, every, your soul through the ages. Soul is just a word I use so everybody understands what I'm talking about. It's not a word I particularly like, but everybody knows what it is. So it's everything about you. And when I did it, um, I went into an actual, in trance, I went into an actual library room where there was a table. And my guide was standing there. And the book, this gigantic book was open already to a certain page. And I had already done my past lives and stuff, and I, uh, I just looked into the Akashic Records because an awful lot of stuff was happening to me really fast, and I really wasn't sure if I was going to live or die this year. I've had COVID twice, even though I'm vaccinated. And it's just exacerbated the underlying issues of lupus. <sighs> so at any rate, I was, I was kind of like interested in like, well, you know, like, should I write my will now? But I went into my Akashic Records and I was actually shown um, that this is my first life as a woman, which is makes sense to me. I was an automobile mechanic, <laughs> and I build and I've been building and pro programming computers. Never been interested in you know like fancy pants, feminine stuff. Pretty much jeans and t-shirt type person, uh -huh. although I am hygienically sound. But the Akashic Records will tell you. What has happened before and what can happen in the future? And I use the word can because let's just say that you look into the future and you see that something terrible is going to happen if such and such happens. If you decide to change, then that such and such is not going to happen. So then you would have to go back and do it again if you want to. Now, I would not do that. I would just let it roll the way it's supposed to go, but be aware. Did I answer that? I, I guess. <laughs> so it's it's not something that's written. 
it, it is recorded, I guess, in time, but it's not, you can't go to the library and say, I want to see the Akashic Record book and it show you everything. No. Yeah, you have to add that at this point. That, that was my point, if I guess. You, um, if you've done meditation and if you've uh, ever done a cleanse of your chakras, there is an eighth chakra that sits right over the top of your head. Really? You've got to access that. It's usually a spinning ball of light. You've got to access that. It will shoot um, up into the universe, for lack of a better term, um, or into the void, however you want to look at it. And you follow that up, and that will take you... We can do Akashic Records sometime if you like. But anyway, that will take you up to an area, and pretty much it's, it's just like when you die. Uh, some people want to see their family. Some people want to see their pets. This is what they're going to see, you know, and is Jesus white or black? Jesus is whatever color you want him to be. Um, and things appear differently to different people. My experience might be different than yours. You might end up sitting in a straw hut on a desert island reviewing all of your life's records. I went to a library probably because I've spent so much time in law libraries. So a library was very familiar to me, and it's probably why I was there. Hmm. But you have to be pretty careful when you do this because um, you pretty much leave yourself wide open. And you don't want to be in there too long. You want to go in. You want to have all the protection you possibly can have. Because you really are wide open when, when you go up through the eighth chakra and anything can enter and disturb your experience. I'm not saying they can harm you, but they can affect you and they can disturb. Hmm. And this is also why a guided meditation or a guided hypnosis is best. Because then you have someone there with you who can help you do that, especially if you have what is known as an ab reaction in hypnosis. Most of the time that happens in um, age regression or in sometimes in past life, but mostly in age regression. That is when you take somebody back down through their childhood and they might run across some kind of big trauma and become extremely upset. That's called an ab reaction. You have to be trained to know how to competently deal with someone's emotions because, you know, like if you're five years old and all kinds of real bad things happen to you, while you're in hypnosis or while you're in trance, you're five years old. Mm. You're not whatever age you are, you know, like now. You're five years old and you don't know how to deal with this. So you really have to know what you're doing when you do these kinds of things. It's, so there's a big difference kind of... between the two, between just past life and your own life. Age regression. Yeah. Age regression. Uh, age regression. Yeah. yeah. That's that's well, past big... past life will take you down. You know, you ask the person, you know, do you want to go down through your childhood into your past life, or do you just want to go into your? You ask the person it up front. Yeah. You don't just hypnotize somebody. You have you have you know like an interview to find out what they want, what they're looking for. Yeah. And then yeah, I you know, watched you, you do that. that. I watched you do that that afternoon with someone. Oh, well, that, that was that very was, quick. That was, that was incredible, though, uh, the fact that you did ask, you know, where they wanted to be, whether they wanted to go back into their own lives or if they wanted to go back into some past lives. They answered you know, I want to go back to past lives, and that's what you did. And right. it was it was absolutely incredible. It really was. Well, it was, what it I was thought, moving. Well, what I thought was incredible was that she mentioned that her name was Max. Yeah. And that you and I, you and I had just heard a Class A EVP that said its name was Max. Now, Max. she was hypnotized, so she didn't hear it. Yeah, but we but, did. So... We did, and that's when I gave you, when she said she was a 10-year-old boy in the German woods and her name is Max, that's when I looked up at you and went, whoa, wow. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that gave me goosebumps. <laughs> huh. It really did. That just gave me goosebumps now. 
So that was pretty cool. Um, I think, you know, everybody wants to be a king and a prince and whatever. And most people, you know, just led regular lives. But everybody's regular life is special to them. Uh So, you know, you might just be wearing, you know, like bearskins in a cave, but that life was special to you. Yeah, at the time. Mm -hmm. I've never taken anybody back that far before. You know, caveman. I don't. I don't know why. Well, That's she went back pretty part. darn far, and that was that was incredible. Well, she she actually had a whole lot more to go. Yeah. I mean, because I was reading her as she was doing it, and I was seeing all of her past lives and flashes in my mind. And you know, like when this happens as a hypnotist, you have to be really careful because you cannot lead somebody on. Yeah. And this is, this is a major problem with age regression. Um, they used to be able to use that kind of stuff in courts and whatnot, but the problem was people or the hypnotist might say, and when you were seven, is that when your father beat you? Ooh. And you can't say that. You have to leave it totally open and have them say it. Yeah. So this is the difference between going to school for it and not. Um, I've had a lot of training on that, and I actually have about 23 certificates, but I don't use them all. Most of them were because it's it's just like prerequisites in college. You know, you have to take all the dumb stuff before you can get to the stuff you want. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, I can do stop smoking, lose weight, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, you but, sure as um, hell got rid of my headache that day. <laughs> I came there that day with a tremendous sinus headache, and man, I walked out of there feeling good. I when I went back home, I was like, "Yeah, I'm driving. I, you know, I feel damn good." <laughs> yeah, you know, the first time it happens to you, you don't feel it right away, but sometime later, like maybe half hour, forty five minutes later, all of a sudden you realize, "Oh man, I feel okay." Yep, you I know, did. I did. I sure did. And then and I was grateful. You might even you might even get a little high. Wow. So I know. It's a cool and it's so easy to do. I mean I did it to you in what, ten minutes? Yeah. It it was great because I like I said, I, I came into you know, met you guys that day and I had been working on a sinus headache for two days. So I was sluggish. Uh. And I really couldn't concentrate. And after I left there, driving home, I was... You, you mean know. after that you drove home and didn't get lost nowhere? <laughs> no, Henry, I didn't. I had a straight shot. I had one road, only one road from the, my house to there. And, and so I couldn't get lost. I only had one road. <laughs> That's a joke, Sharon, cause, because I always managed to get lost. I can get lost in my own oh. neighborhood. <laughs> it's, it's my specialty. Uh. Even with the GPS, it's my yeah, specialty. It's safe here. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a standing joke with all of us on the paranormal view <laughs> for, for Tabby to get you lost. <laughs> and the, the, the reason for it is... I was riding with her one day, and we were supposed to be going to a certain place. She drove around Gettysburg in circles for about an hour and a half. <laughs> that long, but... And still couldn't find You know, he kept saying, we, we passed that same monument like three times, and I said, well, how is it my fault that Gettysburg is one-way streets? No, <laughs> that had nothing to do <laughs> with it. Say? <laughs> well, it's always good to do the tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> three times <laughs> when you um when you drove the back you know like take the back roads into uh gettysburg and you're going through the battlefields do you get all wiped out and depressed and morose uh when i'm going down steinware do. uh when i because uh-huh. i when i go to gettysburg i end up you know coming off of 15 and going down steinware avenue yeah, and me too once I'm going up Steinware, I shut off my radio, I get quiet, and I feel sad. And yeah. I, as soon as I get, get past this one point, it's like a switch goes off. 
and I get sad, and I get very quiet. And I'm kind of like that, you know, for the better part of the time, until I meet up with all the people that I want to. And then right. on the way back, I pretty much do the same thing because I'm in the car by myself. Well, no, I take that back. I got a spirit that rides along with me for a certain distance. And mm. he leaves me just outside of where I live. Uh, I, it's almost like he wants to make sure I get home okay, especially if it's late. But, yeah, I, as soon as I get into that one stretch of Steinware Avenue coming into Gettysburg, yeah, it's it's like a veil of sadness yeah. just comes over me. And it's funny that you said you turned off the radio. I do, too. Yeah. And I don't know why. It's almost See, like I, I'm compelled. I, I can feel it because of the horrific uh, battlefield and the killing and, and just senseless slaughter that took place, and not just in Gettysburg, but any battlefield. Uh, yeah. Not that yeah. I get sad or anything bothers me it's just that you know that there was a battle and a lot of people got killed there that's that's what i feel bad about but i mean the the history part uh i really i really try to absorb and enjoy uh the meaning of why it took place and and what happened at, at that place yeah well you're empathic uh no i never I don't feel anything. I, oh, Henry, you are. You know, whether you think so yes, or not. You are. Even your wife says that you are, but you won't agree with it. Uh, I've only seen one thing. That, well, seeing is not the same thing as feeling. Well, no. I know, but I'm just saying i only seen one thing, and that was out there at the farm. And that was the, the little smoking the smoke, cigarettes. You know, yeah. people smoking, yeah. But yeah, what? you you feel it, Henry. Huh? You you pick up on things. So yeah, you've got an empathic ability, even if you're not, you know, a, you know, a medium per se. You know, you still well, have like, an empathic you're, you're ability. Like, you're like a lot of people. You have to learn how to trust your gut. Um, the girl I went uh, with up to uh, Sax Bridge last weekend. I posted about it on Facebook. You may have seen it. Uh-huh. She has. She it does not trust herself. Nobody's given her any kind of validation. I try to all the time because I think she's an excellent photographer. She has an eye. And she knows when to snap that picture. And that is an intrinsic value. Something yep. told her to snap that picture at that time, and she does. And she captures stuff mostly on me, but... She captures stuff. See, I'm a magnet. Wherever I go, it just comes to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> I also get rid of it, but um, I think that that might be part of your problem, that you are telling yourself that you don't have these abilities, but you do, because I'm reading you, and I'm telling you, you do. Now, you do have a spirit guide that's stopping you from doing something, but um, I'm thinking that with your empathic abilities, you know, like you've already admitted that. If you feel something going through those battlefields, you're definitely an empath. Uh, my husband feels nothing. Really? You know? Although, although I have to say, my husband is very handy. If there's something really awful around, just bring my husband in and they all run away. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's why I don't like to bring him on any investigation. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Jeff, you still there with us? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff! No, uh, he doesn't had to uh, drop off again. Eh? Oh, he's he's here. Uh, he's still on Skype. He may have gone off to feed the cats. Oh, okay. Let me. Look. <laughs> yeah, feeding the still... cats. I think it's my hobby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we all have cats but, on yeah. this program. But you know, no, I'm here. I'm here. Skype of... is being char- Skype is being characteristically uh, irritated. Oh, well, I, yeah, I didn't you're, know. you're kind of going. Yeah, you're going in and out. Did you have any questions? Of course. But I wanted to mention one thing to you, Tabby Cat. Okay. That most psychic or medium 
psychic medium people have headaches that are often disabling. And they're pretty much caused by the influx of energy. And the influx of energy causes your blood vessels to swell. Hence why I always have a coffee cup in my hand. Hence the migraine. Probably caused by the same element um, that we've been talking about. You know, the empathic abilities, the abilities to feel and all that kind of stuff. And you would have the heightened venous pressure like associated with a migraine. Uh-huh. And that could also affect their histamine levels. Yeah. And I know that if I am gearing up to go, like, I don't not do investigations. I will attend them on occasion if it's something that I think that I can help with. Um, I know gearing up to do that, I can get a striking headache. I mean, I just feel like my eyeballs are going to melt out of my head. Uh-huh. But once I get in there and do what I'm supposed to do, it'll fade. Yeah. And yeah. I think, uh, I don't remember who it was, somebody did a major study of uh, mediums, brains, spirit mediums. Uh-huh. And one of the things that they found out, <clears throat> like, I think I think they mostly did automatic writing. Um and they compared their brain waves to their normal non trance writing. Mm-hmm. And they found out that the frontal lobes are asso- that are associated with reading, planning, language, movements, and that kind of stuff <clears throat> were experiencing reduced focus and lessened self awareness and sort of a fuzzy consciousness during their automatic writing. And the low-level activity uh, in the medium's frontal lobes should have resulted in vague, unfocused garble, but instead it resulted in more complex writing samples than they were able to produce while not in a trance. So that can also... um, Yeah, I wish I could quote that study to you, but I don't have it. I didn't write it down. I forgot about that. But... um, the researchers had speculated that maybe as the frontal load activity decreases, the other areas of the brain that support mediumistic writing are further disinhibited. Oh, and you know what? Huh. You become disinhibited if you're drunk, like Ted Sirius. So I wonder if that had something to do with it. Huh. Oh. Well, I guess you're probably, well, you call disinhibited. <clears throat> I, I would probably think that you're probably less apt to pay attention to outside stimuli, you know, because when you're, you know, a little bit, you know, tipsy or something like that, you're mm-hmm. not really paying as much attention to a lot of things. You're kind of focused. You have a tendency to focus on one thing, whether it's staying in your chair <laughs> or something Hugging like that. The curb. Yeah, or not hopping the curb, but, you know, something like that. So I can, in some ways, I suppose I could understand that logic, that if Mm -hmm. your brain or certain areas of your brain are turned off from alcohol or drugs or something like that, then there's other parts of the brain that have to take over. And wasn't that study... For the sections in your brain that are attuned to psychic energy and everything, but separate from the rest of it, and maybe that's why it just suddenly comes out. If everything else is kind of shut off, then that's going to take over. Yeah, that's what they found out. Yeah. So, so maybe that's why we then, get when we get headaches. You know, mm-hmm. because if if I got a really bad headache and everything like I did that day, even though I wasn't feeling well, my senses to that area were just through the roof. And it was involuntary. It it just, they were there. Even though I could, you know, I, I was hurting, you know, through my face and my forehead and everything else, yep. I I was just aware of everything that was going on around me. And in some ways, oh, it's kind of difficult to block it out. 
Well, it is. And the problem was in that particular area where we were, there was a tremendous amount of spirit activity. And it wasn't yes. because of us. They're always there. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons I want to go back to that place. But um, when we walked outside and I was glancing around, I saw a couple of things that I would like to uh, investigate. But um, also, I'd like to photograph the area because it's really pretty. <laughs> yes, it but, is. Um, it's beautiful. When you think about the human brain, uh, the hypothalamus is part of the limbic uh, system, and it is the focal point in the brain where the immune, nervous, and endocrine systems interact. And the amygdala is the emotional center, whereas the hippocampus is the memory center, and whereas the thalamus is considered the third eye, they are all part of the limbic system of the human brain. Right. So I'm thinking that when your frontal uh, lobes, you know, become fuzzy, like was stated in that um, study, that these other parts of your brain, you know, take over, like you were saying. But, you know, like, it seems illogically, illogical and conflicting, you know, when one says the limbic system contains a third eye and the other, and the other thing states that uh, in testing, the limbic system is almost disabled when mediums were experiencing reduced focus. So is there a possible extrinsic entity or force affecting mediums or photographers? Yeah. And... I wondered about cosmic radiation. Now, I'm getting into the weird stuff, but as you know, I'm a member of MUFON. And I was going to be a MUFON field investigator, so I have the field investigator handbook. Now, in the field investor investigator handbook, we're getting into serious, scientific, impossibly anal things to follow up on people, you know, who've had sighting. So cosmic rays are something that I don't really know a lot about it, but I know that they are um, sub subatomic. I can't talk about it. Subatomic particles that arrive from outside the Earth's atmosphere, and um, they are the lowest energy cosmic rays, and they're produced by all the stars all the ordinary stars. And sometimes when there's a solar flare, many particles are ejected, and when they, come, when they interact with the Earth's magnetic field, they tend to spiral into the Earth's magnetic poles where they form the northern and the southern lights. So you have to wonder also about cosmic rays because there was some testing on Ted Sirio's um, where uh, a Chicago physicist tested Ted's photography. And the, he didn't get any of the usual results, but enough showed up that the physicist activated a pointer-type uh, radiation counter, uh -huh. and the radiation counter registered wild swings of radiation readings during his experiment with Ted. Huh. And eventually it calmed down. But um, this physicist is uh, crap. Ah, uh, God, I can't remember. Anyway, this physicist thought that an improbable burst of cosmic radiation at precisely the moment uh, Ted was doing his experiments with photography or could have some influence. Now, you have to wonder how come Ted is attracting cosmic radiation? Or you know, is um, he just attuned to the possible uh, radiation? I mean, when you get down to it, we're all kind of attuned to something. And maybe right. he was able to pick up on the fact that, hey, you know, three, two, one, zap, something's going to happen. And he picks up on it. Right. Um, now, of course, he's not like us, so, you know, like he wouldn't be talking about universe and um, other forces, entities that might affect him. 
Um, but I do know that he was injured in Vietnam, but I don't know how. Um, so there could be something. I mean, for all I know, he could have shrapnel in his body. I haven't yeah. been able to find out any information about that. Okay. Or, as you know, in the Vietnam War, they used an awful lot of chemicals. Um, there could be PTSD that forces his brain to function differently. And yeah. I, know from, I know from my own experience, when I was poisoned in 1991, my abilities just were overwhelming. Yeah. And, um, and it stayed that way. And I did have uh, brain inflammation and a brain injury because I was exposed to so many toxic chemicals. Mm. But um, I don't know. I don't know how this works with uh, psychic abilities yet. I haven't been able to do the experiments with the thought talkery because of the COVID. <laughs> so I haven't been able to, like, interview people in person. And if they succeeded in doing even uh, what Ted Serio has called a blackie or a whitey, where only black or only white shows up, um, which in itself is a photograph because um, in the presence of light, there's no reason the photograph or the Polaroid should be all black. You know, there's no explanation for it. And I've done that, actually. I I didn't mean to do it, but I did. Yeah. But um, you have to wonder about the psychic ability, uh, ESP, Sixth Sense, PSI, that kind of stuff. Um and how, the, how does this work with it? And this is one of the things that I had wanted to do. I was going to make this into more of a documentary and then present it to various educational institutions, you know, who might have somebody who's interested in this kind of thing and have their expert opinion, you know, uh, comment on these findings. Oh. But first I wanted to introduce them with as much information that I could. Okay. You know, like if the person has an autoimmune disease, has heart disease, maybe is epileptic or maybe has suffered many broken bones, you know, some kind of health issue, um, I'm pretty sure that that affects their uh, psychic ability. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure noticed, that it does. Have you, also, have you also noticed, like, when you go to these psychic fairs, all the really good psychics have really awful hair? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, it is time for us to uh, take a break. It'll be about, uh, I don't know, six, seven minutes long. So uh, give you time to stretch your legs and do whatever. Just remember your mic's live. And Jeff, are you with us? <laughs> no, he uh, yeah, hopefully I can. There he is. He's going to let me do the whole thing. Yay. All right. well, go, go ahead and take us out for break. You're listening, you're listening to the Paranormal View on Paranormal. I have been oh. Uh, nice Back try. Uh, Tabby Cat Gash is uh, our ceiling cat. And myself, Jeffrey Gould, and tonight's guest, Sharon Galloway. So stay tuned for more of the Paranormal View after the break. All right. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight, those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. And uh, Barbara's not with us tonight, so uh, I can't find out where we got uh, listeners at from around the world. Uh, so maybe next week we'll know, but I'm sure there's probably... A lot out there in the universe listening tonight. So with that, uh, uh, Tabby Cat. Uh, yes. You uh, you want to bring our guest back in? Uh, yes, indeed. And the second half of the Paranormal View, we have special guest Sharon Galloway, uh, trans medium, uh, psychic medium, uh, photography, and a certified past life regression hypnotist. Welcome back, Sharon. Hello. I have cats who are hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> yeah. I think most of us here on the show have got felines in one form or another. Yep, sure do. <laughs> I've got four. 
<laughs> Only four, Jeff? <laughs> I've got nine. <laughs> so, Jeff, Jeff, if you do have uh, uh, questions uh, for the guest or whatever, uh, take and uh, send the message of what you're wanting to ask to uh, uh, Tabby Cat, and she will uh, get the question read out. How's that sound? That, that sounds good, okay. considering how well my audio usually comes through. Yeah, that's the only thing that I was looking at. <laughs> well, sounds like you got a ghost in the machine there tonight, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, it's almost uh, Skype hates me sometimes. I know. <laughs> uh, so uh, you do. Uh, well, matter of fact, uh, I guess you uh, used to work, or I don't know if you still do, but you used to work at the Edgar Allan Poe House. Oh yeah, um, I retired from there. Um, it had actually closed down due oh, to COVID. It? No, oh, due to COVID. But I was right. a docent. I was a docent at the Edgar Allan Poe House. Well, <clears throat> I got two questions. Is it haunted? And is his spirit still there? He flits in and out. Um, I have to draw him in. As a matter of fact, speaking of drawing, um, I used to do a lot of art for them, and then I would donate it, and they would sell it. And every time I did a portrait or something that included his face, his body, he was right behind me telling me how to do it because he does not like the uh, cartoony-type drawings of him with the large forehead. He does uh -huh. not like that at all. So I abided by his wishes and did him rather realistically with a raven and that kind of stuff, you know, what people want. Um, insofar as being at the house, he floats in and out. And insofar as the house being haunted, the house itself is really not that bad. But outside, I had an experience that really kind of threw me when it happened. Should I tell you? Sure, go ahead. Okay, it's kind of a it's kind of in a depressed area. Um, let's just start off with that. And um, before we opened up the house, I would go out. This was during the fall. I would go out and sweep off the sidewalk because there was some kind of tree there that was just very messy. And I started uh, talking with this guy who um, seemed not quite with it. I, let's see, trying to think of the politically correct term. Can't think of it right now, but whatever. Anyhow, I was talking with him, and then all of a sudden a friend of his came up and Three of us were talking. Now, this is two black guys and me. And we're talking on the street, having full discussions. And then uh, I was motion. it was motion for me to come back into the Edgar Allan Poe house. And I said, well, I got to go. So um, I had turned to say, okay, I'll be right there to the girl who was waving me in. And when I turned back, only one guy was there. And he was talking to air. Uh -huh. So... The black guy that I saw was extremely handsome, had very long dreads. I mean, he was like a movie star guy, you know? <laughs> and I, I said to the other guy, because nobody exchanged names, I said to the other guy, where'd that guy go? And he said, he's right here. And I just said, okay, well, that's interesting. But being in that depressed area... I imagine there's a lot of uh, murders and drug dealings and overdoses and that kind of stuff. So that would be a very active area to begin with. But I thought that was the most interesting thing that I saw at the Edgar Allan Poe house. <laughs> it was outside on the sidewalk. Huh. Uh, insofar as being inside, if I got there early and I was by myself, you could feel the presence. But that house was always packed i mean wow. just packed and it's yeah. a tiny house huh now, do you find, find that that being in in places like that when there's a lot of people uh in the location and everything that it has a tendency to uh to quote the the little medium in the the poltergeist film you know we all hang back you're jamming my frequencies that's kind of <laughs> it 
But, um, you know, it was people from all over the world. And um, fortunately, my high school friends served me well in some instances. But um, there was people from all over the world, and you kind of had to, like, hand signal some things. But you could feel that anything that was in that house just took a back seat while they were there. Now, the third floor was blocked off because, you know, people do nasty things. It was Edgar's bed and a little table and that kind of stuff. And you could only go so far up the steps and you could view the bedroom, um, but you could not go in it. And um, I have a feeling that's probably where they all went. It was little teeny steps. I don't know how... You know those women, they wore those huge dresses back then? I don't know how they got up and down those steps. (laughs) My God. (laughs) It was awful. Now, have you been to his grave site? Oh, yeah, of course. And I got all kinds of good EVP there. Yeah? I mean, uh, was it him or somebody else? Nah, nah. There was plenty of other spirits there. And they were all calling me by name, which was amusing. I made a video about it. I'll see if I can find it, and I'll put it up on Facebook if you want to see it. Okay. <clears throat> They're saying things like, Sharon, come over here. And oh. it was an extremely windy day. And also down by the uh, Edgar Allan Poe house, there's a voodoo shop that I used to go to in Baltimore in the 60s. And it was called, at that time, the Cloverhorn. And it was a real voodoo shop. I mean, we're talking real black cat bones and that kind of stuff, which, no, I did not get. That's pr- that's basically where I got my incense. But it burned down. The whole city smelled like incense. <laughs> and they moved over. <laughs> and they moved over to an area that's near the Edgar Allan Poe house. And I had just come from there, and I decided to just, you know, see if I could, like, peek into uh, the catacombs underneath the church there. Mm-hmm. And um, you can you can kind of, sort of, but it's not a really good angle. But then again, that 50-millimeter lens comes in handy. <clears throat> but um, walking through there, it was so active. It was just amazing. And we're talking like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And, it, well, this is something I've been propounding for a long time. Spirits don't sleep. No. You, know, no. you don't have to wait till the middle of the night. You can do it any time you want. Mm-hmm. So anyway, exactly. what, are you an Edgar Allan? Are you an Edgar Allan Poe fan? You Personally, know dark uh, not not really. I, uh, about as far as I can get to Edgar Allan Poe was seeing the the pit and the pendulum with uh, Vincent Price. <laughs> I mean, oh. No, I, no, that that gave me yeah, nightmares. A little off the source. <laughs> Well, no. the, majority, the majority of the people that came there were already familiar with his writing, and they really wanted to know more about his life. And he was quite the dandy. He was um, about 5'8", and he weighed 140. And um, women liked him. Uh, and the whole story about him being a drunk was made up uh, by somebody who just didn't like him, and it stuck. And there are many, many theories about why and how he died. So back in the day, we didn't have rabies shots, you know, and he was a big fan of cats. And uh, the cats, I guess, took care of the rats in the area, which are still there. But anyway, (laughs) you want to see some rats as big as, you know, like dogs go to Baltimore. Uh, But I know. I, I hit one once with my Corvette. It just tore up the whole front end. <laughs> but anyway. Wow. Uh. <laughs> I, used to work, I used to work in Baltimore City, and um, I used to have to drive up Route 40. And uh, coming through that particular area, the rats were out in force some nights. Wow. But that's when I went with trucks. But anyhow. <laughs> Um, Edgar Allan Poe is a very interesting character. I mean, he had a lot of uh, things that people aren't really aware of. Like, for instance, uh, did you know that he had joined a temperance society? Really? no drinking. Yes. Huh. And, yeah, and there is a theory that I kind of like, 
that during that particular period, they had um, the type of lights that they had were like oil burning and they had candles and whatever, whatever it was, it produced a lot of carbon monoxide. And if you look at his later pictures, you'll see where one side of his mouth droops down, and that is um, an indication of somebody who's been poisoned by carbon monoxide. His sister had the same thing. Huh. So, uh, being poisoned by carbon monoxide myself, I can tell you that it can work wonders on your imagination. (laughs) So, anyway, um, there was a lot of little interesting factoids about Edgar that people wanted to know. You know, like, he really was a womanizer. (laughs) Was it true that he was actually also a... Necrophilia? Necrophilia? No, not no, no, not really. He uh, basically was interested in obtaining information regarding that for the types of stories, you know, that he wrote. Yeah. So but it wasn't true that he slept with the, his dead wife's corpse? No, I never heard that. I'll have to ask the Poe Society of Baltimore about that, but I never heard that. Really? That's probably one of the things that I almost grew up with, was that Edgar Allan Poe actually I kept thought... his wife's body in the bed with him for a long time, that he was a necrophiliac. Yeah, it's probably just a tale. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess it just kind of did wonders for his uh, literary mystique, but, you know... Okay, well, I, I guess that dispelled was, that one. <laughs> he was devastated uh, when his wife died. I do know that. But here's the thing when you always, you know, like you see these stories about people who keep their wives, mostly it's husbands who keep their wives' dead bodies. You know, if you're dead for a while, everything leaves. Your yeah. bowels, you know, you evacuate your bowels, you urinate, all yeah. kinds of stuff. I'm thinking, hmm, so... <laughs> How do you get around that? Yeah, no, you, but, you don't. Well, you don't. Anyhow. That's why I don't think people do that. That's, yeah. That's just. Well, I guess uh, the movies just uh, use that as good PR for for films, because sure. goodness knows that kind of stuff makes for good films. <clears throat> well, ah. you know, back in the day, um, a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, had. Um, The bodies just stayed in the house. That's how the uh, whole living room thing came about. Right. Parlors. They would put the body, yeah, they would put the body out for viewing in the living room. Yeah, so, I don't know, maybe after an extended stay in the living room, you know, possibly something, somebody made something up. Uh, Probably. Uh, I know, growing growing up in Lutherville, my neighbor... uh, she was considerably older than my parents, but I don't really know how old she was. But her husband died in the house, and uh, she kept him there uh, for a viewing or whatever you call that for a week. week. <gasps> and oh I'm God. thinking, uh, I know, ew. My well, mother was just appalled. But um, at any rate, that's, you know, the way they used to roll. Well, my yeah. family come from... Uh, the mountains in eastern Kentucky um, and around uh, Manchester. And I know good and well when, when people died, the casket was set up in the homes and everybody around uh, family and people would come and pay their respects there. But they only kept the bodies there for a couple of days and then they were usually taken up on the hillside to their cemetery or something and buried. Uh, I remember going many times to them and, and seeing some of my old relation that had died or something. So I was little, but well, still I remember it. You know, when Lincoln was shot and he died, you know, they had that train that hauled him all around all over the place. Right. Before he was buried. Well. But um, he wasn't embalmed. Embalming wasn't around then. Right. I don't think was it. No, but I'm pretty uh, sure they they no, took out. They just put them on ice. Yeah, either that they or they took out all the uh, organs. I think. So. Okay. Yeah, uh, but Lincoln was taken from uh, Washington D.C. back to Illinois, where he was buried. 
I thought he did a tour first. Uh, the tour. Because, yeah. like, the long, the long route back. Well, the, yep. the tour was on the train from Washington uh, to, uh, to uh, Illinois. And uh, or maybe it was Indiana. Somewhere over in there anyway. And uh, they had stops along the way where people would come up to the, the rail car and kind of like pay their last respects. I don't think he let anybody in, but uh, it had to stop ever so often to get the, the train had to get refueled and this and that because it didn't travel the way that they do now. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm I'm just really glad that I've opted, you know, for cremation. Throw me in the pit. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, same here. Yeah. You know, uh, oh. go ahead and, and do that and, uh, you know, go down the, the road in a nice country setting and just open up the window and let it flow. <laughs> I, yeah, I, that's the way I look at it. I know you do uh, well, what what, they, what you call, I guess, is dimensional travel. And, and I want to know what is in the different dimensions. How many dimensions are there? Well, I don't know how many dimensions there are. I've only witnessed two. Um, I do know that there's another one, but I have not been able to uh, figure out how to get into it. I'm not even sure what it is. But I can start out with this. In my back field, where my fairy glen is, I gave it that nice little name. It's actually the, um, um, I, that's actually the area where I contact UFOs, but that's a whole different story. But um, give it the fairy glen. It sounds nice, right? I have watched deer, and my husband and I have watched deer just disappear. They go into, like, some kind of portal. I'm looking for that. <laughs> I haven't found that. But um, I figure if I follow the deer, I'll find my way back out because the same ones show up all the time. But in order to get into another dimension, uh, the easiest way to – because I can do that in under five minutes. But I've been doing it for since the 70s anyway. A lot of people refer to that as astral travel. Some people call it interdimensional. You know, there's a lot of different variables associated with this. It depends on what you want to do. Let's say that I want to do a remote viewing of somebody's house who's having some kind of paranormal issue. I will go into another dimension and travel to their house. And I can see everything that's in their house, but it looks like uh, almost as if there's a film. It looks a little watery when you're doing that kind of stuff. I mean, not as bad as if you're actually underwater and doing stuff, but, you know, like there's a little bit of a wave to it. Have you ever closed your eyes and been able to still see your room? Yeah. Uh, right. It. So, you know, it, it kind of is like that, where everything is there as it should be, but it's a little bit different and a little bit wavy. Hmm. So you pretty much just, after you've done it for a while, you pretty much decide you're going to do it, and then you do it. But um, for the novice, um, number one, I don't suggest trying this without really looking into it first. It's not that it's dangerous. It's just that you could open yourself up to a lot of stuff. And once they find you, then they don't leave. And that's a problem. But so, you so, put yourself into a meditative state. And once again, you access that eight chakra, the one that's above your head, the spinning ball of light. And you focus on that and you focus on where you want to go. Now, the first time I did it, I went out into the universe and flew past the planets. That was pretty cool. And then I came back. And as far as these people talking about a silver cord, what silver cord? I've never seen one. But um, do you know who Michael Robichaud is? No. Yeah, I okay. do. Well, he and I actually communicate telepathically. And that is sort of an inter interdimensional thing. Huh. And, um, yeah. It's not, I mean, once you find out somebody else can do it, then, you know, it's really not that hard. But um, it's, it's all in the focus. So once you learn how to focus, where you really should have a goal. Like, 
I want to go see France or I want to see the Eiffel Tower or something like that. So then you put yourself into the trance state, meditative or under hypnosis. Probably you can do self hypnosis, which isn't a whole lot different. You can visualize yourself going to wherever you want to go and you'll go there. Now it's going to take, you know, some practice, of course. Um, and a lot of people get scared right away because they start seeing things that they don't want to see or they don't understand and they don't trust their gut. But um, after a while, it just becomes normal. Hmm. Yeah, so Why, the, the astral it? projection is, you know, along the same lines, as you said. And... You know, now you say that just about anybody can do this. Now, is it more prevalent in people with psychic abilities because they're more open to it? I don't. I don't think it's more prevalent, and I don't think anybody who claims to have psychic abilities has an upper hand regarding this because we've all had lucid dreams, haven't we? Right. Same thing. Same thing. Okay. The thing is, when you're in another dimension um, that is your astral body some people call it a soul now this is when we get into my UFO ET abduction things you've heard about all these people who say they were sleeping in bed and they were abducted by UFOs well do you really think the ETs came and opened their door and carried them out no they took their astral body so it's psychic and yet they come they, yeah they come back you know with like I don't know, uh, injuries or, you know, pain or something like this. That is how they do that. Now, if you're out on the road or something like that and a UFO comes down and the tractor beam hits you and you are go up in the air, that's something different. But most of the time, people black out and they lose time. And they don't know what happened, but they know that they were um, in uh, – a UFO, a spaceship, and they were being analyzed somehow, you know, by aliens or ETs. And I'm saying that this is their astral body. We have, we have lots of parts to us, you know this, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not just our uh, meat suit. You know, we also have, you know, like our astral body, our soul. When we die, it's just the body that dies. The energy is there. Right. So, yep. um, okay, I, I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> I do that. Uh, yeah, I, the, the whole thing just comes down to whether or not you are open to the possibilities. Um, throughout my entire life, I, I've come across so many people that are extremely willing to believe in uh, Bigfoot but they're not willing to believe in ghosts. And I can understand that because, you know, a, a Bigfoot is a solid object. It's a, a being that people say that they've seen, but yet we have never seen any evidence of it. And the same thing can be said for ghosts. You know, there's no scientific evidence to prove that ghosts, quote unquote, exist. Uh, because well, that's why there's, there's nothing in it. Normal. Yeah. And so for things such as astral projection and thought projection and mm -hmm. thoughtography and everything, it's within our physical capabilities to do and see and feel. But the majority of people are unwilling to accept it and it's kind of a shame because, well, you know, it, it really is. It, it's rather a shame that a lot of people are unwilling to believe that. They're, they're willing to accept the possibility that once we pass on, we go to another plane of existence. But yet they're not well, willing to accept that while we're here, we're capable of doing so many wondrous things with our minds. Well, there it, it, is an it's, author, Michael Murphy, you know, have you heard of him? His, his book no. uh, was The Future of the Body, 
and he claims that we only live part of the life we are given. Uh And he talks about dozens of anecdotal and research reports to demonstrate uh, what could, could be called latent reserve capacities of the human brain and body. And, of course, there's parapsychological data that is placed side by side with evidence from medicine, sports, and martial arts and that kind of stuff uh, regarding this. And the example that um, he gives of voluntary control, self-regulation, transformative practice, and that kind of extraordinary experience indicates not only that modern science has overlooked many human potentials, but that these capacities can provide practical avenues for an acceleration and betterment of human life. And as we know, people don't like change, especially if they don't understand it. Right. You know, so when you talk to people about this, where they could have an acceleration or a betterment of their life, you know, like maybe um, you can feel better. Maybe this is the pathway to health. Maybe lots of things. Um, but they'd rather go take a pill. We all know people like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, um, well, people are weird. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all human, and I think, uh, you know, some of us are a little more weird than others. <laughs> people are strange. Should I sing the song? No. Please. Please, you don't really oh, want to hear me you sing. start singing that, and the first thing I think of is uh, the film The Lost Boys. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people um, don't understand willpower. Willpower, in this instance, can also go along with imagination. Imagination is part of your subconscious. This is where... Uh, Memories are stored. So you have your conscious. That's like you and I talking on this program right now. You got your subconscious, and that is where your memories and your imagination is stored. And you have your unconscious, which is like breathing and involuntary bodily functions, that kind of stuff. The thing is, if you can reach your subconscious, which is what hypnosis does, then you can expand, you know, your... um, metaphysical abilities as well as anything else from like being able to remember you know uh, stuff before a lot of people actually use hypnosis or hypnotized to remember uh, stuff before they take <clears throat> big tests in school I thought yeah. well, I, oh man I wish I wish I would have known that <laughs> yeah but um, so anyway you know it, it's all accessing your whole entire brain. I forget, what does it say that we only use like 10% of our brain? Yeah. Somebody something said like that. that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So I always thought which part, but the, I don't think they've ever gone into detail. But I think the what they meant to say was that we don't exercise all of our abilities that are available to us. A lot of times people just don't even know about it or they might object to it due to religious beliefs or fear, you know, which is pretty much what religious beliefs are anyway. But anyhow, meow, meow. Um, But a fear plays a large role in this kind of thing. You don't know how many people don't want to be hypnotized because they think if I hypnotize, they will just start spilling their guts with all their secrets. And that's not how it works at all. No, no, because I I tell you, even though while you were uh, doing that to me, I was very much aware of my own free will. And even though I allowed myself to let go, I still was aware of the fact that I still had my own free will. So for somebody to say, oh, you get, you know, hypnotized and you're you're going to be told you're going to go out and, you know, uh, do something illegal that is against your uh, sensibilities. No, you can't. That, that's not no. going to. It's not going to work because you still have that in the back of your mind. And when you see, it's funny. Every time I see things on on film now, 
about people getting hypnotized and, you know, they don't remember it. Well, yeah, you can tell someone, well, don't remember that I've hypnotized you. But at the same mm -hmm. time, yeah, the fact that you have your morals, your ethics, and everything that you were taught, and that doesn't <laughs> leave you. So if you're told to do something against your, you know, everything that you've been taught, it's not going to happen. But I know. you and didn't ask me to get rid of my headache. It just did. Nope. Nope, not uh, at all. Nope. Nope. So, I mean, I've done a lot of research on hypnosis because once I got into it, I, I just thought it was fascinating. And I've gone back into the ancients, uh, the, Phoeni the, excuse me, the Phoenicians, who begat the Egyptians, who both came from Atlantis, if you choose to believe in that. I'm not 100% sure either way. But um, a lot of this is very interesting that they've been using hypnosis since that time. And Native American shamans use a form of hypnosis as well, and pretty much all of these ancient religions use some form of meditation, uh -huh. and it, which is self-hypnosis, basically. Right. Um, but I have found with myself, I'm not really good at self-hypnosis. <laughs> well. I mean, I, I can kind of sort of do it, but I also found out that that's not abnormal. Self-hypnosis is kind of hard to do. Uh, you can... I've done it with pain. I've done it a lot. Like, for instance, that day, you know, that we met, um, I have, well, I, I mentioned that I had COVID twice. It gave me inflammatory arthritis. I already have existing lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, 10 herniated discs, and right. both of my knees have a torn meniscus. Was I walking around? Yeah, I was. Because I did self-hypnosis before I came up there. I don't take any pills at all. I do like to cuss a lot, though, but anyway, that's my way of dealing. Um, I did just get medical marijuana, which I admit is a little bit of a surprise that it worked. <laughs> I didn't believe it would work, but it did. It was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and you don't have to get totally stoned either, so that's interesting. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't know how that will work with my shamanistic abilities. But... Um, you pretty much talk yourself into not having the pain. There's a lot of uh, cancer patients who are practicing various forms of uh, meditation, self-hypnosis type of thing uh -huh. to reduce, you know, uh, the contraindications of, you know, whatever medicines they're taking and their pain. Right. And in some people, and some people it works really well and in some people it doesn't. Um, and I don't know why. In some instances, the self-hypnosis works really well with me. In some instances, it doesn't work at all. Huh. But it works really. It works pretty good with pain. Well, I, I suppose good. an awful lot of uh, it, it doesn't really matter what it is that you take, you know, for pain, for relaxation, or whatever. I think a lot of it just has to do with your state of mind. It, it and it's like. You know, placebos that they right. give you in experiments and everything. Not telling somebody, oh, well, this is a pain medication, but it's really a sugar pill. It's what you perceive in your mind that's going to work. But, right. you know, the, the fact that, you know, that particular day that I met you, I was not expecting to have my headache go away. The only thing that, because you told me to concentrate on something, and that's the only thing I was thinking of was, was damn it, I want to feel better. <laughs> I mm -hmm. don't want to feel like this. I, I'm, I'm tired of having this wrecking headache. And ding, well, there it is. Our, it's gone. our experience was a little different. Now, I had talked about uh, doing the past life with the other person mm -hmm. um, and, and told her, you know, like, this is how it works, this is how it rolls. Um, now, with you, normally, I would uh, talk to you a little bit more, but the most important thing when you're hypnotizing someone is to clarify that they agree and they want to be hypnotized. Right. You have, you have to have that. 
That is the first thing that you get out of the way before you actually go into, you know, I did a rapid hypnosis on you. Yeah. Now, if I was actually treating you for pain, I would do like, it's not real long. It would be like 15 minute, you know, gradual type of thing. And then I would take you deeper and deeper and we would examine what's in your body that's giving you this pain and you would um, take care of it that way. Right. But because, you know, we were kind of stuck in this environment, I just said, what the heck, we'll go for it. <laughs> wow. I'll tell you, it, it, it definitely worked. And one thing that I was really surprised about was that I felt so relaxed that I actually felt you reach out and grab a hold of me because you thought I was going to fall over. And I didn't yeah, realize did. that, that that's what was happening. I could actually feel my legs giving out because I was so relaxed. I'm like, yeah, let me crawl up in this uh, very interesting place <laughs> and just take a nap for a while. <laughs> and I, I just realized uh, this is not the place to take a nap. <laughs> wow. <laughs> not a place well, to take a nap. Because, because we did such a rapid induction, I didn't do the whole thing. Um, I didn't give you the whole spiel because we were also on time constraints because we had to do that Facebook Live thing. Right. So normally I would give you the whole spiel about how you're going to remain standing and all this blah, blah. But I didn't even go there because I knew it was going to be like under 60 seconds, and I figured you're tiny enough I could pick you up. (laughs) 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 I'm All kind right, of glad our, I had a chair behind me. <laughs> our time is... Uh, I'm I'm always amazed that the people I meet and become friends with are, like, very petite, and I'm just over here dragging knuckles and grunting, you know, because <laughs> I'm God. Wow. <laughs> but our, our time is running down real quick, like... Uh, yes, it is. Uh, My another, goodness. Two hours have gone by too darn quick. I wanted to ask you... Well, ask me another question. Uh, do you know Elaine Kuzmeskis? The name is familiar, but I don't know her. Uh, she works, uh, where's it at? Um, in Connecticut, uh, at a place. Uh, she does uh, charts, star charts, and readings, and, and all that. And we usually get her on once a year, and she'll do many readings for people in the chat room if they want one stuff like that uh, but she usually makes the predictions for uh, the new year and stuff like that hmm. I don't do anything it's, like that she works with the New England uh, school of metaphysics or something like that metaphysical something oh okay I forget what the whole name is but well, I have um, several decks of tarot cards, and uh, basically I just look at them. Oh. And um, it's really, no, not really my thing. My yeah. thing is uh, more science yeah. and mechanical, technical type stuff. Um, I'm not opposed to any of this. I read my horoscope every day but only at night, and then I see if it was right. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, who was it that, uh, I think it was uh, Samuel Clemens that said he gets up every morning and reads the obituaries, and if he isn't in it, yeah, it's a good day. That stuff, you know, used to interest me when I was younger, Uh but not so much now. I'm not opposed to it. I think it's fun. Um, I have a lot of opinions uh, regarding uh, readings and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm pretty harsh, actually. I'm I'm very I'm very truth oriented, and some of the mediums that I've met up with, I just don't think are. Uh, Mm, I don't know how to put this in a fuzzy, warm, fuzzy way. I just think that they're taking advantage of some of their uh, clients. And I don't like it, and I can't be associated with it. So I just distance myself 
as far as, as as much as I can. And there's everybody in the world out there is you know since COVID hit, all of a sudden everybody's a medium. Yeah. No, so no, no. Um, <clears throat> I I I only work with a certain few, and uh, they're ones that uh, can tell you things that's actually going on uh, uh, that that's happening and uh, I get evidence to prove what they're saying uh, yeah. mm-hmm. we uh, we was doing a house one time and we was trying to get this little girl to talk with us and uh, that was one of the claims that the people in the house said uh, this little girl takes her dish towels out and lays them on the sinks and redoes things and, and all this kind of stuff. And they, they've even seen her. So we were sitting there this night, and I was talking, asking questions, trying to get her to talk with me. And all of a sudden, the medium says, she's standing right in front of you. And I'm reaching over to get my camera to turn it on because I'm going to try and take a picture, see if I can get a picture of her. And... Uh, uh, the other guy that was there with us, he said, Honey, can Henry take your picture? And my recorder captured the little girl saying, I'm smiling. Oh. Oh. So that's uh, nice. when you get evidence, when, when they sit there and tell you something like that, and then you get the evidence, uh, yeah, they're pretty pretty locked in. So, Well, it's one of the main reasons that I bring cameras and stuff with me is number one, I'm a gadget freak, but number two, I like to be able to prove right what I saw and heard. And that's really it's also it's a really good excuse to rack up my credit cards. So, <laughs> <laughs> well I, I never seen or heard anything other than when I listened to the when I played the recorder back. That's what that's what I caught it on. But yeah, I hardly Well sometimes it. Sometimes you hear it with your own ears, and that's what they call the class A E B B. Right. You right. hear it as if somebody is just speaking it. But sometimes you hear it in your head, which is the way mediums work. They usually just hear it in their head. Huh. It's almost like a telepathic type voice, which is also, I must add, the way ETs communicate. That's why I'm not a medium. With me, anyway. <laughs> I'm not a medium. I'm not a psychic. I don't have any talents <laughs> oh yes you do i uh, don't need yeah them. you actually do oh <laughs> and... <laughs> i've been telling him that for years sharon but he just <laughs> won't believe me yeah all, all i'll Something say holding all i'll say is when Something i go holding into him back <laughs> when i go into a place that's supposed to be haunted or something all i say is nobody gets between me and a door <laughs> you know, I might run from Bigfoot, but I'll send you a couple of photos that um, I've taken where the ET is only three feet away from me. Wow. And I just sat there. And you act like a hunter. I'm not a hunter, but, you know, you kind of, if, if the deer see your eyes, they know you're there. So what you do is you squint. So I kind of treated them as if I'm a hunter and they're deer. Oh. So it squint my eyes down to like barely nothing and then just keep snap. I have one of those uh, things that you can hook onto your camera where, you know, you got like a six foot line. You can sit far away from it and take pictures. Right. right. And I also have the Polaroid. Now, the ET killed the night shot, huh. but I got the polo- I got the Polaroid. Wow. Cool. Yeah, I actually had to throw that away. Some other time, I'll tell you about how they can affect your laptops, computers, and cameras. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our our time. It can get expensive. Our time is running out pretty quick. Uh, okay. Any last questions? Uh, I didn't get anything from the chat room tonight. Asking well, one, I think's all we had. Uh, but um, I don't guess. Uh, Tabby, you got a question, or Jeff? Uh, Jeff keeps fading in and out. Uh, no, just uh, one final question for you there, Sharon. How do our listeners and followers get a hold of you? Oh, um, there are two Sharon Galloways on Facebook. One is not active at all, and the other one has a banner that says Delmarva Paranormal. 
Um, there is a Delmarva Paranormal dot com. There is a contact page on thehauntedview dot com. Um, I also have a photography, but I didn't add a contact page on that. I really need to rebuild that website. But there's, uh, you can email me at S as in Sharon, V as in Victory Galloway, G A L L O W A Y at gmail dot com. All right. Okay. Well, we uh, we enjoyed having you on. We want you to uh, stay on for a few minutes after we get off, and we'll talk with you real quick. Uh, won't keep you very long. And uh, okay. So. Uh, I, I guess Jeff can't uh, say anything. I can say a little. A little? Okay. <laughs> but do you, do you have our just guest I last week? I struck many men dumb. dumb. <laughs> no, it's, it's just Skype. Skype does not Skype work for him. Skype does be doing compound sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you have our guest for next week? Uh, yes, I do. Next week, uh, our special guest will be Donald Allison. He is a paranormal investigator as well as the author of, and more most appropriately, I Met a Ghost in Gettysburg. And the second one, I Met Another Ghost in Gettysburg. <laughs> so we will be talking to him about um, his and our exploits with him in that area. So yes. we'll talk to him next week. That sounds like a, a winner to me. Um, we got uh, only just a couple minutes here before I start signing off. Uh, so, and and uh, Sharon, if you if you got some final thoughts too, you can you can put them out there because uh, uh, I do have about uh, oh it's less than that, it's, uh, less than a minute. So I guess we're going to have to just kind of like talk talk fast. Well. <laughs> I, I did want to say that now that the COVID restrictions are less than they have been, I do have a medium box that I built. You know what that is, a medium cabinet. Uh -huh. um, and I, this is where I'm going to be performing uh, most of my photography experiments because it does increase your um, self-awareness and your self-attention um, in other words, you know, like it eliminates all the yada yada that surrounds you. So um, I do have a medium box. By the way, it's very active. Originally, I built it because I was going to do ectoplasm experiments with it, but I'll get around to that some other time. Okay. Um, I'm not real sure. I'm not real sure I want to go there. <laughs> 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 I, it's you know, one, like, one thing to get choked on. All it's right. one thing to get choked yeah, on exactly. hairballs, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we gotta we gotta run. We will see you next week uh, at the same time. So until then, uh, good night, everybody. Night, everybody. Good night, right. Sharon. You've been listening to the Paranormal View on the Para X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of The Paranormal.